All right, welcome everybody. Uh, thanks for coming out. Uh, my name is Vipul Sabaya from HP. And I'm Tim Simpson from Rackspace. Okay, and today we're gonna talk to you about Project Red Dwarf, uh, database services for OpenStack. Uh, we'd like to talk about what the project is all about, uh, how it fits into OpenStack, and give you an overview, uh, as well as how far we've uh, come since the last summit. Okay, so today we'd like to ask a question, which is why should databases be considered a first-class cloud resource? Because if you think about it, a database is just a program, right? And programs run on servers, and we have Nova already. So Nova can run them, and we're not talking about making like Apache or PHP or something a first class service. And we have tools like Heat that makes it really easy to automate deploying things like databases. So what gives? Why would we even be here discussing this? Well, I think the important distinction is that databases are data. They're one of those fundamental parts of your platform stack. And yes, Nova can store data. It does a really good job of it. In fact, Nova is so quintessential, it sort of is like the building block for everything. If you look at projects uh, so far in OpenStack, they all came from Nova somehow. Cinder came from Nova Volumes. Uh, the project that used to start with a Q, Q word uh, came from Nova Networks. Um, you know, and that's really great. I mean, Nova, there's so much that you can do being able to spin up uh, virtual servers in the cloud. Um, but Sometimes many users don't really want that level of abstraction. What they want is a database, right? They want a virtual application rather than an actual server. And so this is all about the level of abstraction. Uh, we think it makes sense to sort of make database a first class citizen. So let's compare something that's very close, similar to databases, uh, file storage. Uh, sometimes just setting up a virtual server and storing files there is all you really need. So I think lots of people, when you first set up a server, like probably lots of people in this room were in high school and they set up a server, what's the first thing they did? So they just stored files on it. Um, and this works really well. But then you run into problems because you have to archive and protect all that data. And you have to really protect it from an environment that doesn't understand its true for purpose, right? So uh, to Nova, those files are just bits and bytes on a virtual hard drive. But to you, they're something else. They're, they're an abstraction, and that's files. They could, they're memories, right? They could be pictures you took during a vacation. They could be pictures of like a new addition to the family or something. You really want to protect that. You want to make sure that they're backed up. You want to make sure that you have instant access to them when you need them. You want to make sure you can access them over the internet. And you know, databases are sort of in the same boat, relational databases. Um, in some ways, yeah, they're just a program that runs on a server. But they're also data. Like, they could be your entries on a WordPress uh, blog. Um, they could be contacts on your phone, right? And you want to make sure, most people, when they're making apps, they just want to make sure they have access to that data, um, that it's safe and they can scale it up and down as they need to. Okay, uh, so this is sort of the level of abstraction that Red Dwarf has sort of been designed for. Um, simply put, it's, it's a way to provision and manage database resources in the cloud as efficiently as possible. Um, Red Dwarf, it, you know, it does a bunch of things. Uh, some of it include automating administrative tasks like deployment, configuration, uh, managing backups, restoring data. It's, it's things that you don't have to do anymore, right, in terms of dealing with databases. It lets you think of your data at a higher level. Um, so, you know, the, the data that you're storing, you can think of it as just your blog posts or the contacts on your phone. You don't have to worry about where it's actually stored. Um, you know, it, it also frees you from the mundane tasks so that like, you can worry about so that you can worry about things that actually matter to your application rather than um, managing that data. Um, so what, with Red Dwarf, what you get is a managed service, not a service that you have to manage. Um, oh. Sorry. We spoiled it. <laughs> There's this thing that keeps coming up. All right, there we go. <coughs> Hopefully no one looked ahead. All right, sorry about that. So what you, what you get with Red Dwarf is a managed service. It's a service that takes care of scaling, high availability, multi-tenancy, and also uses your resources effectively. Um, these are things that you, know, you typically, as a uh, deployer of a database, you have to worry about, but these are things that Red Dwarf also takes care of for you. And for the best part, uh, Red Dwarf is fully open. Um, all the code is available on Stack Forge today. Uh, so from the server side, server side pieces, uh, to the deployment scripts, as well as the CLI to manage everything. Um, you can find it all on Stack Forge. Uh, Rackspace and HP, we've been working on this for a while now. Um, and we have an API as well as an implementation that we're completely dedicated to. Um, and one of the great things about Red Dwarf is that 
it's uh, built on OpenStack for OpenStack from the beginning. Um, that's why we feel you know it, it's the goal of Red Dwarf has never changed. It's you know it's been designed to be the core thing or the thing that manages databases in OpenStack, and that's why we we feel pretty strongly that it should be the de facto uh, database service in OpenStack. Um, our API, if you look at our API, it fits nicely with other OpenStack APIs, and it's very similar to other OpenStack APIs. Uh, so it should be very familiar to you. So if you think about um, applications, right, application architecture, unless you're writing something on the desktop, in which case in the middle you're going to see where you're probably talking to like a cloud uh, service these days, or like a mobile app you'll be talking to a cloud service. But if you think about a web application, you're always going to have an a, uh, architecture diagram that looks a little bit like this. And in the middle, there's always going to be a database up there. And for sort of uh, newer apps, it's going to be maybe like a NoSQL um, type database. But for most apps, it's going to be a relational database. And so really, something that you know, this adds to the OpenStack picture is this missing puzzle piece of having a, the ability to instantly spin up a relational database. So just imagine if, um, you know, Red Dwarf isn't in OpenStack right now, but just imagine if it was, how easy that would be. Okay, there's more and more methods out there to deploy OpenStack. Uh, DevStack's probably the most prominent one. I think, you know, most people, does any, who here has used DevStack to deploy uh, OpenStack, okay? And then there's like, if you go to the expo, like I know last summit they were giving away like USB keys where they would just set it up for you. So imagine if you set up OpenStack and you had, had access to Red Dwarf along with all the other great services that it provides. Um, you'd be able to set up uh, your web applications very easily. You'd set up a server to actually run the code. You'd set up a database to handle all of your data. You'd back it up to Swift and then you'd be able to use the tooling such as Horizon to sort of see, you know, manage that data. And so we really feel that um, this is a piece that would make add value to OpenStack, and it would fit really well. Uh, but as it is today, um, you know, if you set up an OpenStack cloud, you just have to sort of deploy the server yourself, install SQL on it, uh, back everything up using cron, secure it yourself. And you know, he can automate this, but if you think about it, it it's sort of equivalent to AppArmor, right? AppArmor is a really awesome program, but you're still responsible for it. You have to think, okay, I need to check this, I need to make sure that nothing's breaking and that everything's getting update, updated. Whereas if you just had an abstraction that says, hey, I want a database, from that point, you're good. You just let Red Dwarf do it for you, and you have your database. Well, you know, we're not an OpenStack, but here's the good news. You can still use this today. So, you know, Red Dwarf works as a, you're shocked. Red Dwarf works in conjunction with the OpenStack, you know, cloud you already know and love. So. If you have access to an OpenStack setup, you can deploy Red Dwarf to it. And uh, it complements any install regardless of whether or not you control it. Okay. Uh, so how does Red Dwarf complement OpenStack? Um, so uh, Red Dwarf leverages most of the OpenStack components, uh, things like Nova, Cinder, Quantum. We make use of all of that. Uh, we've got a fully functional REST API. Uh, we feel like it's been well thought out. And we consider that to be the open API for database management in the cloud. Um, if you look at our code, you'll see that we make a ton of use of the Oslo code base. So the common code that's shared across other OpenStack services is also the basis of our implementation. Uh, what, mean, what this means is that it makes Red Dwarf very familiar, and it also reduces the learning curve uh, for somebody new. Uh, we've also developed a piece of software that we call the guest agent. This is the thing that's first class on the database instance, uh, on the compute instance that's running the database. It's the thing that's also responsible for managing the database software uh, for the end user. And you know, finally, we built, from the beginning, we've built uh, Red Dwarf with pluggability in mind. Uh, so one of the biggest things, one of the biggest design goals we've had it was from the beginning was to support a many types of databases. It's something we've been thinking about from day one, and at this point, uh, we, we do have support for more than one database. One of the things that we like to think about when we talk about Red Dwarf is, I think we're at a point where we can think beyond just plain old VMs. Uh, we should be able to offer experience that's at a higher level than a VM. So you shouldn't have to SSH onto a VM and provision software and manage things that way anymore. And that's kind of what we feel we've been able to accomplish with our REST API. Uh, so our API allows the user to forget where their database is actually running, um, how many instances it may span, it may be you know, three, uh, a replica which contains three instances. The user doesn't have to know that. Um, all, the only thing that they have to think about is sp spinning up a database, using the API to spin up the database, or managing it via the API, managing backups, uh, creating schemas, or you know, additional users. 
One of the outcomes of such an API is that it actually, we feel it enhances the user experience. So just as Swift uh, lets you treat arbitrary data as objects within a container, uh, we allow users to think of databases as resources that can, you know, that can be treated the same way. It's not just a VM running a database anymore. And yeah, you know, there may be users that actually want to the fine level um, control. And for those users, we also have an API, basically the ability to turn on root users. So if, if the way you roll is to you know, be root and do everything on your own, you can do that with Red Orbit. But you know, that shouldn't be, we feel like it shouldn't be the only way. Uh, the, another area that people tend to not think too much about uh, when running databases is you know, there's a ton of management that actually needs to happen uh, things like optimizations that a user typically has to do, uh, securing the database when it's installed. Um, with Red Dwarf, what you get is a optimal database every single time. Um, so whether you need a small test database for a QA or a large production database, you can be pretty confident that Red Dwarf is going to you know, give you the right thing and it's going to configure it the right way. Um, whenever a database uh, is created by Red Dwarf, it's also going to be secure. Uh, this is something that Red Dwarf does. It's something that you don't have to worry about. And you know, one of the areas that HP as well as Rackspace that we've gotten pretty good at is uh, optimizing the use of our hardware. Uh, so you know, databases typically require more memory and less CPU, right? Uh, when you run databases on standard VMs, you're probably not gonna be able to you know, run other types of applications along with databases and utilize the hardware in the right way. So running Red Dwarf on those, that type of a deployment, um, you can you know, optimize your fleet uh, without you know, having to turn the, turn the keys over to everything. And one way we actually use this at Rackspace is we have OpenBZ. Uh, we have a driver for Node that actually creates OpenBZ containers. So with OpenBZ, there's security concerns where you don't want to just give someone shell access to a container, right? And by using um, an actual API, we can give people access to uh, MySQL applications, but without actually giving them access to the OpenBZ containers because there's security you know, you know, concerns there. So you know, if you have an API for, red, uh, for databases, um, it allows for other possibilities in the future. For example, you could actually have fully managed replication you know, using an API like this. And you could also have like auto scale replication, uh, failover. And these are the kind of features that when you talk about just spinning up a database on a Nova instance, you know, it's very easy at first, but the further you get along, like the more stuff you want to do, the harder it becomes. And so if people just want to set up a database and they're not, they really don't want to be concerned with this thing, uh, having an API that just allows uh, the ability to turn on things like replication or uh, failover, um, it would really be tremendous. It would be very, very useful. Um, we also could add stuff like cross-AZ region availability is something that uh, you know, HP is looking at. And uh, the other cool thing is that if this is presented as API and it makes it really simple for people to spin up databases, it would make it that much simpler to actually deploy OpenStack using OpenStack with um, you know, components itself. Because if you think about it, uh, OpenStack is actually like that diagram that was up there where there's an infrastructure database that sits in the middle of everything. So if you could just spin up a Red Dwarf instance, it would actually make it even easier to sort of self-host it. Yeah, if you guys went to the talks earlier today where, you know, I think it was uh, OpenStack and OpenStack or Nova Bare Metal, um, there's, no, you know, there's no reason why Red Dwarf couldn't be the thing that's actually spinning up that database, the first database that Nova is going to use. So, uh, real quick, we're going to get into the architecture here. Um, and hopefully this doesn't bore anyone, but if uh, people out there have worked with OpenStack, worked with the code, we just want to show that Red Dwarf is very similar. Um, so if you have, you know, if you look, basically Red Dwarf sits to the side over here, and on the right side we have like Nova and Swift and you know all the all the good stuff from OpenStack. Um, in OpenStack, you typically have these daemons that you're running, and in Nova, how it works is that there's the message bus and the infrastructure database, which are sort of like the nerve center for the whole thing. They communicate between all of these processes. So with Red Dwarf, we have the Red Dwarf API, which handles incoming uh, REST HTTP calls. And then we have the task manager, which is just an RPC service that uh, talks to the API for longer running uh, jobs. Um, we have our own infrastructure database, as well as message bus we use for communication between these pieces. And you know, if you're running this in a VM, you can actually make it uh, those be the same thing as the as what Nova uses. But if you're deploying it for real, it's probably good to set this up separately. Uh, then Red Dwarf will talk to Nova and OpenStack components using the REST API. And the reason we did this is this way you can actually set up Red Dwarf with an OpenStack deployment that you don't have full control over. 
So it allows it to be very uh, flexible, and you can sort of set up Red Dwarf with your existing deployment. So we've talked about the history of it. Um, you know, if you if people here saw our talk at the Grizzly Summit, um, it was interesting because from the beginning we've always tried to make Red Dwarf something that's happening in the public, and we've been working with uh, HP for a while now. But it was interesting at the Grizzly talk because we were very focused on the fact that we were both sort of using the core idea of Red Dwarf, but we would separate the daemon. So we'd have slides saying, hey, here's how we do stuff with Rackspace, and then Bibble over here, they do something kind of different with HP. And it was sort of neat that we were able to swap those things out, but we were, we were doing that to sort of meet a need, which is that we both had stuff we had to deploy to production. Well, since Grizzly, um, work between the two companies is really, uh, I think we've ha had more time for it. And HP has gone and they've switched to the public version of Red Dwarf, right? We started working on it every day. This is where all the work happens. And because HP got into it, there were some things about the public version, which, you know, we thought there were, we thought it was okay, right? We did the public version back in uh, May, but it had fallen, it had sort of fallen apart and there was some, it was rough around the edges. HP got into it and really started fixing stuff. And both companies started focusing on it. And now the public version of Red Dwarf, um, is just easier to set up and use than it's been in a long time. There's been a lot of work that's gone into it, and this is where everyone at both companies is focused on. This is where all the commits that have the red dwarf go. So we've gotten away from um, pretty much every issue that you might have seen before, and we're truly dedicated to the code you see on Stackforge. Okay, uh, so yeah, since, as Tim mentioned, since the Grizzly Summit, um, HP and Rackspace, we've both decided to converge on the open implementation. And since then, we've actually made a lot of progress. So. Um, at this point, we've got 16 full-time contributors um, that are contributing every single day. Uh, we've got complete integration with the OpenStack CI process. So every single commit that we make to Red Dwarf today is being gated by both unit tests as well as integration tests that were run against a DevStack-based install. Uh, so we have a live server that everything is being tested against before code actually ever gets merged. Um, all of our code is hosted on Stackforge, so we have the server side pieces, we have the deployment scripts, we have um, the, the client, the Python Red Dwarf client. Uh, all these pieces are actually available on Stackforge today. Um, we've also done a lot of work uh, to integrate ourselves with DevStack. So um, because we're not an official project, you can't just go into your local RC and say, hey, you know, I want to enable Red Dwarf. Uh, but it's, it's not that much more than that. It, what we've done is we've taken a local.sh approach. So you download DevStack, you download Red Dwarf, you copy over the local.sh and you run stack.sh. What you end up getting is DevStack and Red Dwarf living you know, in, in harmony. Everything is working together. Uh, we've also, you know, since we've decided to go to the open uh, version of things, we've changed our development process. So uh, no work is actually getting done until, the, unless there is a bug or a blueprint uh, filed in Launchpad. So the only way things actually get into the trunk is there better be a bug or a blueprint. So. That's been a big change for us. Also, since the Grizzly Summit, uh, when HP started looking at the open version of Red Dwarf, we realized that you know getting up and uh, getting Red Dwarf up and running wasn't that straightforward. Um, so we've actually gone through and with Rackspace itself, we've fixed a lot of those issues. We've made that process very easy. Um, we've also along the way we've improved our documentation. So if you go to wiki.openstack.org/reddwarf today. Um, you're going to find a ton of information about running it, what it is. Um, you'll even find design docs, things that, you know, as we've implemented features, we've made sure that we document why we made the decisions we made. Uh, we've also been busy working on features. Uh, you know, the two new features, or the two that are actually in, are in trunk today, uh, user level quotas and rate limits. And we've got uh, patches already up, submitted. They're not fully merged yet. So that's why the next two features are in progress. Um, we've got the support, we've got the ability to do manual backups. So take a backup of your database and you know, at a point in time and restore it to that point in time. Um, we've got notification events. So as Red Dwarf is doing things, it'll you know, send, send up events to RabbitMQ. And we've also, you know, one of the things is that we've improved a lot upon is pluggability. Um, when we first started uh, when, during the Grizzly Summit, the only database that was supported in Red Dwarf was Oracle's MySQL. One of the requirements for HP was that we run Percona's version of MySQL. So uh, we've improved code, we've made you know, code a lot more pluggable to be able to take any database and plug it into Red Dwarf, and it, it should be fairly easy. So whether you want to put in MariaDB or Postgres, 
at this point, we're, you know, the, the code base is such that you could easily do so. Um, in terms of backups, when we implemented the backup feature, uh, that was another big thing for us was, you know, we've got a couple of tools that we want to use for taking backups and managing them, um, but adding a third tool or a fourth tool shouldn't be that much more difficult. So maybe some of you are out uh, listening to this and thinking, okay, this seems kind of neat, um, and it seems like they're working together, but how do I know this isn't just a toy play? How can I trust <coughs> this? Well, to throw some stats up, uh, we have about 285 unit tests. Uh, we have 222 integration tests that run in bake mode, which means if you were to pull down the code right now and just run talks, you could run all of these integration tests uh, instantly along with the unit tests. And then of that same suite of integration tests, we have about 144 of those integration tests that are running in VM gating. And what VM gating means is that we actually set up a VM where we try to get everything working as close to uh, real life as we can get it. So we actually set up Nova for real. We call Death Stack, in fact, to set it up. Um, we try to get all the actual features working. We make sure we build an image that has, uh, you know, the guess on it. And we try to basically get it to work like it's going to in real life and we run the test again. Um, so we're able to run stuff really quick, but we also are doing our due diligence to check that it's, you know, going to have no bugs that might happen from uh, the real concerns that can occur when we're interacting with those systems in Flex with Nova. Um, we have 16 developers right now, like people just said, and all of them are running a VM, right? And so they're constantly setting stuff up. And so these deployment scripts are being really well vetted now between two different companies. Okay, people in different time zones now are actually working on this thing and making sure that, that it functions. Um, so uh, you're gonna have more luck now than I think people have had in the past, like when they tried to download this when it was just sort of the public version. Um, and most of the API features, and along with uh, major regressions, can actually get tested just when you pull it down and run stuff instantly. Uh, so actually all the XML testing happens just when you pull it down and it runs in about four seconds. Um, now one cool thing is that if you, you know, for, in OpenStack we've had XML and the API sort of from the dawn of uh, the whole project. But there's sometimes some grumbling that, opens, that XML has been treated as a first class uh, citizen uh, between the two APIs. Like JSON might work really well and XML is kind of flaky. And we all like JSON here, I think, which is the reason for that. But in Red Dwarf, we're trying to make sure that XML like it's, doesn't get the short shrift. So we run all of the same tests we do in JSON for XML to make sure that it works. And we're, we're fairly confident that the XML quality is going to be very high. And also, there's Pep 8. Okay. Uh, so, so plans for the future? Um, well, right now, we're on the very cusp of getting manual backups in, right? That feature is almost done. What we'd like to focus on now is automated backups, right? It, this is where a, uh, having a cloud database makes a lot of sense because you just provision a cloud database resource and you say, I want to back this up to Swift. So we want to have these things backing up uh, constantly, automatically, and make it really simple. We also want to have point in time restore. So let's say that your WordPress blog gets hacked on a uh, Sunday. You can go back to Saturday when you think that the database is still okay and restore from that exact point in time. Uh, additionally, we want to look into replication. This is something that I think we've been talking about since uh, we first even looked at having a cloud um, you know, database type resource in both companies. Replication is something that's really going to be exciting when it's paired with an API like Red Dwarf and it's made easy to do. Uh, another thing is that if we're compatible with OpenStack, we want to make it very similar. So we have the DevStack integration. It would be really cool to get Heat and Horizon support as well. So being able to manage like application stacks with heat would be really pretty cool. Um, and of course, if you could like see schemas and stuff in Horizon, that can make things easier for some people. We also want to support more databases. So HP came in and they added Percona, and they did a really awesome job at it. Um, it seems like it should be easy to add other things, like MariaDB or even Postgres going forward. Uh, the core architecture of Red Dwarf was designed to make this kind of thing possible. And um, it seems like that's, that's where we want, to, we want to look at that stuff. And finally, uh, it would be really cool if somehow we could provide all these to OpenStack users, you know, just very easily. So we want to look at getting incubated. Okay. All right, so uh, one thing that's pretty obvious, I think most of you have to agree, is with web applications these days, there's a pretty uniform architecture. So you have your web tier that handles requests. You have some messaging tier that may be performing asynchronous tasks. And you typically have a database to store that data that you care about. Um, if you look at the OpenStack architecture, it also falls into that same category, right? Um, you've got the Nova um, infrastructure database. Um, this is something that should come for free, you know? So it, it seems like every application out there requires a database. Why is OpenStack something that, you know, OpenStack doesn't ship, seem to ship with a database sort of solution? 
Um, why is that the case, right? Um, it shouldn't be an afterthought, we think. Uh, it's something that uh, developers are going to need anyways, so it, sh it only makes sense to actually bundle it with the rest of OpenStack. Um, when we wrote Red Dwarf, uh, we wrote, that, wrote it with that in mind, basically. Uh, we, want, we want to feel that a, we have a product that complements OpenStack. Uh, it actually enhances the positioning of OpenStack as a cloud, and it, it means that it, it's going to meet the needs of most of the developers because database is going to be a requirement for most developers. Um, Red Dwarf is also growing. Um, we're growing in terms of features, we're growing in terms of usability, and we're increasing our quality every single day. Um, HP and Rackspace were both fully dedicated to the project, and we wanted to be successful. And we hope that you know Red Dwarf is the thing that fills the void in OpenStack. Um, the project is very active. Uh, with two companies on board, we feel like we have that critical mass to you know, make these things successful. Uh, we're dedicating more and more resources, um, and we're trying to grow this project as fast as we can. Okay, so um, if you're interested in this, and I hope, I don't know, maybe some people have become more interested in this talk, um, go to your hotel tonight and uh, skip the parties, right? And instead, <laughs> you know, what, what are you going to miss, really? Uh, try installing uh, Red Dwarf, right? Try deploying it. Um, we had it so it can set up in a VM. Go ahead and test it out. Uh, we're really, we really think that it works a lot better than it has before, and we welcome feedback. Uh, this isn't, you know, super simple, but it's not rocket science either. So, and if you're very interested, join as a contributor, and you know that can either be actually adding stuff to the Red Dwarf code base, or it could just be, you know, looking at Launchpad and going through and maybe adding bugs or new features. You know, get active on like the wiki. Think, you know, make sure that this project, um, if you're interested in relational databases, make sure that it goes the direction you want. And so, so join us. Uh, finally, we've always talked about the Pound Red Dwarf uh, IRC room. Uh, Pound Red Dwarf on Freenode is sort of our home where we, where we chat all day. We've talked about this from the very first time we ever mentioned Red Dwarf and OpenStack Summit. Um, one big change, another big change since Grizzly, is there's actually a lot of people there all the time. Like I bet if you logged in right now, you would see uh, members of both companies that aren't at the summit that are talking about things. So, so before, there was always, I think, a few people in Red Dwarf, but there were probably bouncers. Um, we are there all the time right now. and so. If you have anything you want to talk, ask about, um, there's no need to wait for these summits to talk to us in the Q&A. Uh, just get on RSC and you know, there's people that be just be thrilled to answer your questions. And if this seems like, if you agree that a uh, relational database is something that should have a first class, uh, be considered a first class citizen in the cloud, uh, if that's something that you actually think is a good idea, um, you know, let your voice be heard. Uh, we're trying to get this incubated and if you to support something like this, um, just let us know, you know, let the community know. So. Uh, thank you for time. I would like to open up for questions. Thanks. Do you have a question? Uh, sure. Okay, we can hear you. So, you talked about you said relational databases a couple times. Yes. I mean, how if I was running Mongo or any other non-SQL database, don't I want all the same things that Red Dwarf is providing? Yeah, so at that point you're talking about making an API that could handle either a like non-SQL database or a SQL database. Well, I mean, it's any data store really has all those same asks for the most part. Um, why, why is it really limited to MySQL, it seems like? So it's really, I think it's, when we think about uh, this product, like we want to make it so you can actually Make it a bit richer, right? Not just provision and set it up, but actually be able to like change users and uh, schemas. And if you think of something like a non-SQL database, it's going to make that API very like it's going to give it a split personality. So it makes sense to sort of focus on making it uh, for relational databases. Now, about a year ago, we at the uh, San Francisco summit, we talked about making Red Dwarf something that could deploy a lot of other stuff. Uh, but it really seems like the sweet spot for this is relational databases. Now, you know, people on the team that are sitting here, they may disagree with that. That's, that's just my view. I think uh, relation, relational databases is what makes the most sense. Um, if you try to just make an abstraction for anything, it seems like that would get kind of messy.
there is a lot of overlap. Right, I mean, at least we use the code or something. Yeah. Even if it's different public APIs. Sure, and that's that's an absolute possibility. Okay. So I would say, like to me, the APIs, when you talk about database services, the APIs only diverge on relational versus non-relational. It only diverges when you think about running you know, XYZ resource in a VM versus running a more of like a massively multi-tenant type of model. Right? So if I'm going to throw Mongo or Redis inside very similar to me, um, just that, well, you have to back up Redis and Mongo. You have to, there's replication for those as well. Now, yes, they're handled differently in the covers, but if you abstract them there from an API, it would seem very similar to me. Now, if you're thinking, well, I'm going to abstract away the instance and just give you request for storage and everything happens on the back end, that's a very different API than, you know, some, some database management system with inside a VM. So, I personally think that it, it can be done. Okay, so Daniel works with us at Rackspace on product, so if he says he's going to fight for it, uh, maybe I misspoke, yeah. <laughs> so, yes? Something about your agent, uh, uh, what does that implement today? Okay, so in the public right now, we have a reference agent that is implemented in Python. And it basically talks over uh, RPC, over the uh, message bus. It's actually the same Oslo code. So it's, uh, it was actually patterned after the old um, Nova managers. And when it, you start up a new uh, Red Dwarf instance, it's going to start a Nova instance. And it's running this uh, guest agent that's just going to receive these RPC calls. And so, for instance, if we resize the database, um, that in Nova could actually mean that it's going to make a copy of like the compute instance, right? And it's going to ask you if they look okay. Well, the, one of the biggest jobs of the guest agent is just to get stuff from the API, so like it can list users and you can add new schemas, but it also checks the health of the actual app that's running to make sure that it's okay. So in Nova, when you uh, make a bigger instance, like you actually have like a copy there, and it asks you if it's looking good before you blow the old one away. Um, because we have this guest agent there, we can actually see if MySQL is healthy if we contain it and things are still working before we make that decision. So that's sort of his job. Um, were you more curious in like how it was uh, constructed or just what it's been on so far? Oh, so when you first provision an instance, it creates a, a user on the database uh, called OS admin that has uh, root permissions and it can only be used from that uh, actual compute instance. And it does all this communication over this user. Does it connect to the database? Yes. The local database? Yes. something that we've been looking at a lot because um, it is it is sort of strange to use that that same message bus for everything and uh
I think you know we're going with an implementation at this point. We have an implementation that requires access to the database to be able to manage it. Yeah. And if if there is a requirement to not log into that database, we'd have to have another implementation of the SDK. Yeah, and you know I'm the developer, so take my estimations with a grain of salt. But I feel like that's something that we could do. Um, right now, you know we don't. So Rackspace, we're using the C++ agent. And every time we get a feature done, we make sure that there's something that's working in the public and the reference agent. And it should be very possible to make it so that it just wouldn't, when it provisions that, uh, it just doesn't provision that OS admin user, instead it just pings it for the health, because there's other times when the guest agent is useful. And we just take the ability to like, you know, add users and see them just take that away. So one thing that we do today is that when you resize an instance, uh, we actually select a different MySQL template file um, that we install. Like so, we stop the database, um, resize it, and then actually change the MySQL file. Uh, going forward, I think that that's in um, you know that's the idea is that we'd be able to uh, tweak things like that. Actually, yeah, Hubcap's got a blueprint right now uh, to be able to change settings um, on the actual MySQL. Yeah, like like right, right through the. Uh, So looks like we need to this, I guess, last question. What about when we run Red Dwarf in my own data center on my own private deployment of OpenStack? That's impossible. No, I'm just kidding. You can do that. It's, uh, you pull down the code, and um, yeah, you can totally do it. So. Yes. OK. And then after. We are actually on that. Uh, I think in production, we're a few <coughs> behind right now. So. Oh, the reference guest? No, I mean the reference. Oh, we're everything other than the guest. We're right now. Oh, cool. So. Okay. Uh, thanks, everyone. Thank you.